So my name's Diane Wooden. Um, as of yesterday, I've been at NASA Ames for 30 years. Wow. So, I, um, I started off as an infrared spectroscopist on the Kuiper Urban Observatory, and I've been working with Tony Colaprete and Rick Elphick and Kara on the LADI mission. I'm a science team member, and I was also on the science um, team of the LCOS mission. So the fact that this mission has a similar instrument means that we'll be using similar analysis tools and some of the algorithms I've developed to, to, to mod, moderate whether the spectra have any cosmic ray uh, integrity with regard to, you know, uh, basically we're in the field of the galactic cosmic ray environment that can cause spurious detection. So I'll be using my experience and also my ability, my ability to step into the unknown in order to analyze the exciting spectra that we're going to get from Latin because I can tell you what we are expecting to find but I'm sure that we're going to find some things that are far more complicated than we can imagine. That's where it's great to be working with a small team that's really close-knit and willing to um, uh, really brainstorm with each other and I just have to say that was the most intense but creative time was the six months we worked on Elcross data because we really were seeing things we never thought we would see before with regard to the water. We not only saw water, but we saw other volatiles. And so we would basically do things independently, then come together and check, check with each other. And it was really through that brainstorming process that we came up with ideas beyond what each of us individually could come up with. So I'm really talking to you as a science team member. So even though I'm the one standing up here, you really need to see that I'm representing this team, this very innovative thing that I'm doing. So I'm going to be talking to you about the UVS science. And UVS stands for the UV visible uh, spectrometer on LAD. And that's in the slides that Brian showed. It's this instrument um, that has L-cross heritage. So the context and motivation for the UVS instrument is that we, are wanted, we wanted to know and complement the other instruments on, on LADI. And particularly, want, we want to analyze the structure and variability of the lunar exosphere. And as Brian told you, the lunar exosphere is, is like a good vacuum on Earth. It's equivalent to where the space station is currently flying. And so you would say, well, that seems pretty weak. Why would you think that we need to look at it now? Well, Apollo landed on the surface of the moon for about 40 years ago, and we think that enough time has gone by that the, the pollutants, the engine exhaust and so forth, that they left on the surface by their landing procedure has eventually very slowly dissipated from the lunar surface by photodesorption and then loss from the, from the exosphere. But basically, we want to try to characterize the exosphere before we get have more human activity, because the Apollo actually produced a gave as much mass to the lunar exosphere as there was already eons the, over the age of the solar system. So the top 11 science goals identified in the Nas National Research Council report include determine the global density, composition, and variability of the fragile lunar atmosphere before it is perturbed by human activity, and determine the size, change, and spatial distribution of electrostatically transported dust grains. And so I will talk about how these particles perhaps get electros electrostatically lofted, like dust devils except electrostatic dust devils. And um, I wanted to say that I interchangeably use the word particles and grains. And so um, I tried to switch the word particles, but just to let you know that we're thinking about things that are about 1 20th to 1 200th the size of a human hair very, very fine particles, because they're so low in mass that those are the ones that can get lofted up to the heights of 50 kilometers, which is about three times that of a commercial airline, um, that you can imagine from a commercial airline looking down at the surface of the moon and trying to see what particles actually are that you're flying through at that point. Or we can also look towards the surface and see what the density is closer to the surface. So what do we know about the lunar exosphere? This is um, work by Boston University where they're looking away from the sun. And so this is the view from Earth looking at midnight away from the sun. And what's happening is at new moon, the moon is going right directly between the Earth, moon, sun line. And therefore, the Earth is actually going through the tail, or the moon is causing the, the tail of the exosphere to go over the Earth and actually can be observed in addition to using a coronagraph type uh, 
observatory technique to block the scatter light of the moon, then you can actually see the glow of the exosphere. And the, this particular atom, sodium, is very prevalent in your worldview. It is everywhere in those yellow street lamps. So if you could block the brightness of the scattered light of the moon, you would see around the moon a glow of yellow. And in fact, you would see it being a more intense on the sunward side. So we know a little bit about the variability of the exosphere from these kinds of studies. And in fact, this is how we know that meteorites impacting the moon can significantly enhance the exosphere. So once uh, we know that the whole soil of the moon or regolith, as we call it, is impact garden. That all of the fine grained materials are extremely sharp and they're very electrostatically activated, so they're chemically active. And um, the entire exosphere is basically a product of what comes out of the moon's surface. We know from Apollo that they took samples of the regolith, the powdery material, and sampled below that, and we didn't see any chemical compositional difference. So we know that sputtering must be pretty uniform for almost all atoms. But yet we only see sodium for sure. And now from other orbiters in the recent couple of years, we, see, we also see helium. And when the Apollo went to the moon, they saw argon burping out from lunar quakes, and we don't see that argon now. So we know at least over 40 years of some variation in what is producing, what are the sources of lunar exosphere. And this is an example from the Kaguya mission, where um, it was called Selene and then Kaguya, the Japanese mission where they provided fantastic visual imaging of the moon, in addition to studying some very important effects. And this is showing basically how the surface density of uh, sodium is changing depending upon their, uh, the time and the, and the viewing position. So from Kaguya, we do know some aspects of that there is temporal and spatial variability. Now, we also heard just a, you know, an hour ago about the dusty lunar atmosphere, that in surveyor images and Apollo images that there are uh, striations of light um, as you're looking towards the sun pre-sunrise. So this is hard to think about in terms of the Earth's atmosphere because we have such a scattering atmosphere. But I'm sure sometimes you've probably seen rays of pink coming up either before or after sunlight, sunset, sunset, and that only the sun is down and yet you're seeing these rays. And that's because there's particles higher than the surface. If you're looking out towards the ocean, then they'd be up above high enough that they're catching the sunlight itself. So this is the way in which you can basically drop the contrast of the sun by having it pre-dawn or post-sunset. Um, the dust concentration <coughs> has been modeled so that we know to what sensitivity we have to be able to look for the dust. And here's an example of the dust concentration uh, plots. This is a distance from the terminator. And um, the reason that we're plotting with regard to the terminator will come, become clear in a moment. Um, because that has to do with the charge exchange that we expect the dust grains to participate in. So the concentration is expected to vary strongly with altitude, and our nominal altitude is 50 to it's 50 kilometers, and we what might we get down to, Rick? Oh, I mean, we can get down to 20. 20 kilometers. Very awful. So we'll be getting down to this range where we're expecting about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Um, <coughs> particles per cubic centimeter or per cube, or is, you'll see this either cm to the minus 3 or cc per cubic centimeter. So the, some of the requirements for the instrument are driven by the science, and so I wanted to go over in words and then as an example of so what, what we're looking for. So our, t our key requirements are to measure the sodium and potassium, because we know that those exist and that those are strong lines. We want provide a robust detection over a single orbit, and there's seven orbits in a single lunar day. Um, and we have to, to provide those detections with a single to noise ratio of greater than five. So for those who are not familiar, this is basically just like the Swiss Army knife of all scientists, this SNR, or single to noise ratio. If you want a measurement, you have to have it to be a certain number of times the level of the noise. 
So this is saying that basically that you're seeing a line, a spectroscopic line detected five times that of the noise level. And in this case, we're seeing it uh, at that level of detection in only one orbit. Where our other uh, requirements are to measure two out of the list of these other atoms, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, iron, and titanium, and measure two or more out of oxygen, OH, or water. And this is driven by the, trying to understand the volatiles on the lunar surface. And in which case, our goal is to get a signal to noise ratio of greater than five over the whole 100 day mission. So a signal to noise of three is a called nominal detection. A one sigma detection is really iffy, and you wouldn't really want to publish any data on it. Three sigma is characteristically good. Five sigma detection is, yeah, we've got it. So that's the goal. Yes, we've got the sodium and potassium in one, in one orbit, and that means we can very well characterize their variability in time and space because uh, the position of the terminator changes over the course of a lunar month. Um, and we'll be looking for these uh, atoms to vary as the position over the lit side of the moon and the position of the terminator as well as, as any geographic positions. So the dust then is of interest because, and there are complementary ways to measure the dust on board. Um, the, the Labby spacecraft, but in particular, we're going to try to look at it through scattering properties. Um, we're going to be looking, basically using the spacecraft to scan our view um, from altitudes parallel to where we're flying, down to the surface and back up, and so that will scan between 50 and one and a half kilometers, and we're, our goal is to, de de to detect a minimum particle density of 10 to the minus 4, 1 in 10,000 uh, particles per cubic centimeter. For dust grains that are 10, uh, excuse me, 100 nanometers or 0.1 microns. And again, human hair is about 20 microns. So 1 20th or 1 200th, the size of a human hair. And we're going to do this by looking in occultation, meaning we're going to be looking at the sun and trying to see the particles absorbing the sunlight out. And that's very similar to you getting a dirty windshield that you can tell that you've got a certain amount of grime because you've got not only because you're seeing less light through it, but also you notice that you'll, you'll see some scattering off that. And you'll, you'll get a glare at sunset or dawn, especially it's bad for driving. And so what you do is you wash your windshield, right? Well, here we're basically using the fact that the dust is both absorbing and scattering. But the sunlight is so bright that we actually have to look for the scattering before the sun is above our observing horizon or, before, or just after it sets. Um, so we're going to be looking in towards the limb, so the limb meaning uh, not directly at the sun, the sun is another part of the sky, but if the sun is above, suppose the sun is at noon, you're still going to have some particles scattering that light. And um, we're going to be looking at forward scattering and back scattering because those are very fairly efficient. Uh, I want to just give an example of the rainbow's back scattering. So, you always see a rainbow when the sun's behind you, and you see a sun dog when, you, when it's forward scattered. So who's seen a sun dog or a moon bow? Okay, so that's forward scattered. So that's what we're going to be using, that kind of physics to characterize particles. So let's just take a look at the periodic table to see what of the atoms are we actually looking for um, in particular. And this is driven by what atoms are expected to be there and the wavelength range that we have set by the spectrometer and what atoms are available in that wavelength range. So in particular, our key science requirements are to detect sodium and potassium. And there's reasons for that, for them being so bright without there having to be a super huge abundance of them. So for instance, we don't really expect sodium to be largely, uh, much larger abundance than what we expect to see in the sun, but instead these are actually physically large atoms because they lay on the left-hand side of the periodic table where these are the atoms that have a closed shell plus one electron. And that actually makes them fairly big atoms, uncomfortably able to fit into a mineral. Uh, so for instance, the minerals that have sodium and potassium, the sodium and potassium is most easily photosputtered because these uh, particular atoms don't fit very well. Unlike whereas carbon fits very well. It's either uh, bonded in rings or bonded uh, like in diamonds and nothing else wants to fit in with it at all. You don't get um, the same ability to sputter carbon. It's very difficult. 
So the other thing is that because they've got this electron hanging out there outside the closed shell, they have an extremely large dipole moment to their radiation. So they're very efficient radiators. They glow really well. And that's why probably we use sodium for our street lamps, because it's abundant and it glows really well. So um, here's a list of the common lunar minerals uh, off of Wikipedia. And basically, you can see that calcium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen, iron. Basically, these are the other, the other materials that we're going to be looking for. They trace what's in, what's in the dust on the lunar surface. And I gave an example for a lunar dust material called anorthosite, which is a calcium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. So this is the lighter material that's on the surface of the moon. So we're basically looking for the atoms that are expected to be there. Here is an example brightness spectrum that's been computed. And I've uh, double checked the wavelength positions of the potassium and the um, sodium lines. So basically, you can see that it takes a wide wavelength coverage to be able to sample the OH, silicon, aluminum, calcium, down to magnesium, and potassium. And that's what drives part of our requirements to have the wavelength range. So the, this is the intriguing aspect that I think is one of the things that the science team is going to be working um, closely with the other instruments to make sure that we um, understand how our viewing of the atmosphere is complementary with the other instruments which, which take advantage of us running through the atmosphere. So um, they're actually collecting the dust particles and having them cascade down and make measurements of them or they're using a mass spectrometer. So the spacecraft itself is uh, basically at a given altitude running through the atmosphere, but we have this advantage of being able to scan ahead of ourselves um, or towards, towards the surface to try to know what the vertical profile is. So we're going to try to be linking what we're measuring at a given altitude with the whole vertical profile. And so our limb nod, for instance, is we have the spacecraft, and we nod to look towards the surface and then back up again. And so we're basically looking down through greater atmospheres. So, so imagine you're on a commercial airline and you're looking out, like at, you could be looking out at night or in the daytime, but basically you see that the, it's a very blue sky, but as you look towards the surface, you start to see maybe pollution or color in the sky. That's because you're looking for greater density um, of atmosphere. And it's similar when you're looking at a sunset as the sun gets lower and lower in the sky, you're looking through greater and greater path length of that atmosphere. That's why the sun becomes red, it scatters out the blue light. And so the, we're using those, those aspects of the geometry in our moves of the spacecraft to actually sample um, in a given single orbit in a fairly quick time manner what the vertical structure of the atmosphere is. And then we also look directly at the sun with a, with a filter and um, we use the filter to cut down the intensity, and that we're actually going to be looking for the particles absorbing the sunlight. So here's another view of that same process where we're looking um, at the dawn terminator. So the sun is below the horizon, and we're looking at the scattered light right above where the sun will be coming up, and we're going this way in our orbit. And we also have the challenge of the fact that at, in the plane of the sun, in the plane of the planets, there's a lot of particles that are that are there, have, they have tens of thousands of years' lifetimes um, because they're basically comet debris, broken up asteroid debris, it's called the Zodiacal Light or Gegenschein. And on some occasions I've seen the Gegenschein from the Sierras or so forth, it basically looks like a big V of scattered light close to sunset um, in the sky towards the west. So the Zodiacal Light, as measured by the Clementine spacecraft, is shown here, and basically you're going to be seeing this scattered light, and it has a particular pattern structure because um, uh, that you're looking in the wedge of, basically, you're looking out um, right in the line of the planets, and that's where most of the zodiacal light is, but that's also where the sun is going to be. So what we're interested in seeing is what amount of this glow is actually going to be due to the lunar particles and not the zodiacal light. So, the trick is that they're very small particles, and small particles benefit by blue light. They can be more easily scattered blue light than red light, because the red light is too big for them to scatter. Basically, a, a dust grain scatters wavelength efficiently when the, when the wavelength is about the size of it, or smaller. You just can think of, like, if you've got a disk, if a wavelength is coming towards that disk, if it's bigger than that disk, it doesn't scatter very efficiently, because it has a quantum mechanical scattering effect. But if the wavelength is smaller, it's like a wall and bounces off. 
So basically, it's this part of the spectrum that we've got to get well, and that's what drives us being around the moon with this wavelength coverage and above the Earth's atmosphere, because basically the Earth's atmosphere does not effectively measure below about 3,200 3200 nanometers, or, 30, or 0.32 microns. So this is the area. So what you're seeing here is a predicted amount of straight light or zodiacal light. And how does that compare with the expected uh, flux distribution from the scattered light of the dust from the lunar atmosphere? And here's where you see the blue line being slightly greater than the purple line. So this is the wavelength region, which is going to be our pay dirt, or pay dust grains, is to really look in that part of the spectrum that no one has been able to really look before. Because only l -Prowse instrument and this instrument, the only ones around the moon capable in this wavelength range. So here is a simplified um, cartoon that I, my colleagues, when we look at something like this, it's, um, I was thinking about how to communicate this, is that we, we can think about all these things happening at one time. And so I actually took some of the data off of this graph to try to simplify it. But basically, here's a picture of the moon. You're viewing the sun, of course, in a very bad scale. It's much, much further away. <laughs> but just imagine, here's the sun, and there's, it's producing solar wind particles, uh, sol solar storms, like coronal mass ejections, and solar UV and x-rays, and that's impinging on the relatively airless moon. And in particular, we're going to talk about the solar wind particles and the solar UV and x-rays. So the solar UV photons um, that basically they hit the front side of the moon or the side facing the, the lit side of the moon. And in this case, just need to abandon Pink Floyd, forget that there's a dark side of the moon. There's only a back side and a front side of the moon. And in this case, the, the front side is being hit by UV photons and photoelectrons and protons. But the photoelectrons are, have, are winning. The really hot, uh, short wavelength ultraviolet are kicking electrons out of the rocks and creating on the, on the sunlit side about plus 5 to plus 12 volts. Well, that's really no big deal. You connect your car battery. You're not really worried about that amount of voltage. But the electrons, um, the electrons travel away from the sun. So when the solar wind happens, which I'll show you in a moment, basically you've got these energetic particles, protons and electrons dominate. And helium atoms are also a part of that. But the protons are more like bullets. Their energy is, because they have such a high mass, their energy is going into very directed motion. The electrons are much lighter, and so for their temperature, they have very much more random motion. So protons are more like bullets, electrons are more like a beehive moving towards the sun, uh, moving away from the sun towards the moon. So when the beehive of electrons from the solar wind hits, hits the moon, it actually has enough transverse motion to get through the plasma wake and hit the back side of the moon, whereas actually the protons don't really hit the back side of the moon. They just go straight straight by. They either hit the surface in the front or they go straight by. And as a consequence, the backside gets charged about minus 1,000 volts. So you've got minus 1,000 volts on the dark side and plus 12 volts. So they've got to equilibrate. And what we think that happens is that it's the dust that carries the charge. It's like a battery that's got to neutralize and that that's what drives the dust mountain. So we're interested in the physics of how this happens, and also the potential environment challenges to working at the poles of the moon or working um, working on the moon. Would we ex would we experience uh, dust storms? Certainly, the astronauts found that the surface of the moon was so electrosticky that their suits were covered in dust when they walked into the module and brought up the oxygen. It smelled like gunpowder. Um, their suits actually got cut over a few days' time frame because the dust grain stuck so well to the suit material. Yes, Rick? And I just wanted to make, mention one thing, and that is the dust fountains and the actual existence of that high altitude dust is very much a question that is not established. We do not know. That's what Laddie is for, just to actually go and answer the question some people think happens. Okay. Astronauts who actually walk on the surface say, well, the surface of the rocks looks pretty clean to me, so I don't see where your lobster of dust is coming in. It's a real mystery. It's been a mystery since Apollo. It's been a mystery over 40 years. 
Laddie is, is it one of the things Laddie wants to do is answer that question once for all, like a myth busters kind of a, approach to the thing. Answer that question <laughs> once for all. So do, are there dust devil fountains or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is a solar wind? Well, the sol this is a beautiful solar dynamics observatory video. Um, which shows the plasma of the sun basically gently drifting off into the space surrounding it. And this also has a more complementary energetic uh, parallel, which is a coronal mass ejection. We have really rapid movement of particles. And this material will reach the Earth in three to four days. When it does, um, the Earth's magneto tail responds to these changes in the solar wind. And this is a video clip from the Themis satellites showing the structure of the magneto tail. And what I like about it is it really looks like a bubble blowing in the wind. You actually can see the compression uh, of the magneto tail based on the density of the solar wind. And um, the, the little dots represent the positions of those satellites. If you plot on the same scale, the moon's orbit, um, you'll see that the moon actually goes in and out of the magneto tail. It's in the magneto tail for about six days per lunar cycle. And so there's a bit of a change and the plasma environment that the moon is in. And um, what's fascinating is that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, with its lamp instrument, um, has observed a change in the helium surface density of the, of the lunar exosphere, so that basically the exosphere builds, and then when the moon goes into the magneto tail, the amount of helium drops down, and then it recovers in, in about eight days, eight or nine days. So what we're actually seeing is that even though the plasma environment is a little bit different, um, we're seeing a response of the exosphere to its being a little bit protected from the solar wind heating events. So we actually are seeing that the solar wind is having an effect on the exosphere. And we, we hope that we can see such similar time variations and link them um, with the help of LRO's lab instrument, which is going to be um, orbiting, continuing to orbit at the same time we are, and this is an example of its orbit geometry. So our orbit geometry is a trailing uh, equatorial orbit, and theirs is a polar orbit. And when they are looking down at a dark surface, but there's sunlight above the surface, that's when they see these atoms glowing. So the, the wonderful opportunity here is that we have Artemis, two, which are two probes in orbit around the moon, and they're characterizing the plasma environment. And again, those Artemis is two probes from the Themis mission that were, re that were inserted into lunar orbit. We have a lunar reconnaissance orbiter with its thermal mapping and, in particular, its lamp instrument that is at shorter wavelengths and, and is a great complement to the LADI UBS data. And so that's where we will transition to Kara showing you the actual instrument. And I'm willing to take any questions. Yes? Um, where is LADI in relation to the, uh, the moon's equator? Is it right on the equator? Does it move up and down? Oh. Um, it doesn't, uh, once it's established in its orbit, it doesn't change in latitude. And But Rick can answer that more. I have it's to a, have a It's a pretty low inclination retrograde orbit. It's kind of like Apollo in many ways. So it's fairly low altitude. We're orbiting opposite to the usual sense of orbital motion like about the Earth. So we're going opposite to that direction, and we're, st we're staying within about 23 degrees of the okay. So the inclination is uh, it's, it's retrograde, 23-ish degrees. And then that orbit is set somewhat by the stability of the orbit, because the moon's gravity is so uneven right. that we, in order to fly low and maximize our fuel, yeah. Yeah. we kind of we've picked a trajectory that can maximize our science and maximize fuel. Because I think that's something I didn't realize that the moon's gravity was so lumpy that when you get down pretty close, you're actually pulled towards the surface by different amounts, depending on where over the surface you are. I have mass, con mass concentrations. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you got consistent ones on a signal to noise ratio reading, and you said that normally you would throw that out, but if it was consistent, would you ignore it or would you well, you basically you would say that there's no signal there with respect to the to the noise level. But what you do is you basically. Well, what if it was just you know in the noise, but it was still there? Well, that's the benefit. We we always the, the other Swiss Army knife tool of an astronomer is called the square root of t. Basically, it's based on uh, Gaussian statistics. So basically, the width of distribution is the square root of the number in that distribution. 
So if you, if you quadruple your integration time, you'll double your signal to noise. Okay. And so what we do is, that's what we're planning to do on these weak ad atoms that are expected to have weak lines. We we'll just keep adding and adding and adding more data. But even after the 100 day mission is over, if we don't see anything that's greater than three sigma, we'll have to say that it's within the fluctuations of the noise. Okay, that answers, thank you. Yes. You mentioned that, that then not that the spacecraft's gonna do, and I was just wondering how dynamic of movement the, the spacecraft is gonna have as it, as it makes, you know, is it, is it like a, a standard pattern that you'll be flying it through? Is it just a couple of nods in orbit or something like that? Um, we do this pattern um, several times in a day. Can you speak more to that? <laughs> sure. It's, it's a matter of uh, changing the attitude of the spacecraft really only a few degrees. So you can imagine um, going over the, over the, uh, over the uh, surface of the planet and UBS looking out in the direction that it wants to look across the limb of the planet. And basically they'll be doing, well, the whole spacecraft will actually be doing this kind of slip back and forth. So it's really about 10 degrees, 15 degrees maximum. But it does change according to Laddie's orbit, which is constantly evolving because of the mass concentrations. And so actually, we need to adjust that from orbit to orbit because the orbit altitude itself is changing due to the bumpy gravity. That's, that's something we will continue to have to monitor. And uh, about twice a week, we do an orbit maintenance mm -hmm. and we need to change the orbit back to something we can manage. Otherwise, the spacecraft would impact the surface sooner than and, and all those fine movements, is it, is it all prop that you have to use? Are you going to slide no, those the reaction is. Yeah. How many reaction lists? There's four. Well, if I haven't communicated well enough, I'm excited. <laughs> 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 so, and I think that I represent the rest of my team. We're very excited. September 6th is our first, is our first available launch window. And um, we're just really, we're just so excited. Also, we had a workshop about uh, six weeks ago where Artemis and LRO and and our team got together to talk about the science synergy between the three instruments and we're really excited about what's already coming out and what we're going to be helped with in terms of understanding the plasma environment. This one thing to be linked up to the solar, to the sun-based uh, heliospheric science, but we'll actually be measuring the plasma environment in the lunar environment as well. So thank you for your, for your interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.